Okay, we are going live. I figured tonight, as I'm waiting to capture the strawberry moon, that I would go ahead and process the NG6888 or Crescent Nebula. This is the result of processing four sessions. It was 715 10 second exposures. I took 90% of the best and that resulted in about one hour and 47 minutes. So let's get started. Let's go through my process. I'm by no means an expert. I'm still learning, but <clears throat> I want to share the process as I go through it and help others. So first thing we're going to do is stretch this to take a look at what we have. And we can see it's washed in blue. And in fact, if we look at our statistics, what we're going to see is we can pick this view. You can see the blue signal 1.24, 1.21 for green, 1.9 for red. So the first thing I want to do is crop this image, get it sort of in the window that I want to work with. And then I'm going to address the imbalance of colors. So one of the things I like to start with by doing is open up a window and look for examples of the nebula that I can work off. So these are obviously much higher fidelity, visibility, etc. But <clears throat> it'll give me a guideline of what to expect. These are some pretty intricate details. Let's pick this one. Looks like it could be closer to what I'm going to work with. It's a little washed out, overcolored, but I think this will be a decent guideline. So notice that we've got these two yellow stars, this bright star. I try to pick out some patterns to match. So let's look at our image. And you can see we're in the same configuration, although Looks like our triangle of stars might be a little bit different. I think we need to flip this. So let's do a fast rotation. And by the way, these are all icons that I saved. You can simply take this little triangle, drag it here, give it a name, and then right click, process icons, and save them and reload them. So it's useful when you have default settings because it saves those settings for you. So we're going to do a vertical mirror and just flip it. And take a look. And it actually probably would require rotation as well. But I'm going to actually stick with this orientation. I like this. So I'm going to super saturate it. So you can see the different sessions had slightly different alignment. That's why we're getting these artifacts and borders. So we want to stay in this main signal area. So I'm going to open up dynamic crop. I usually like to open up the corners a little bit and then just grab this edge. I'm going to bring it inside of where that frame is. Bring this one in. I want to kind of keep these stars. They look interesting. We'll go this way. And notice that my X is kind of centering on the nebula. We're going to bring this. Actually, I didn't grab it the right way. Bring this way up. So now the nebula is a little off center, but that's OK. Eh, I think this is good. So once we get that, we take our dynamic crop window and we just check it, <clears throat> and it's split. Now, if you want to see what this is going to look like, you can take your screen transfer function. That's what stretches the image to make it visible. And you can use this little icon to link 
the channels and that'll normalize the channels for you in the preview. So that's what we're working with, which looks a little bit better. But I'm going to actually unlink it because we're going to first fix the issue with the blue being higher intensity. And the way I like to do that is I have, first let me make sure I set my working space so that my red, green, and blue are all one as well as my gamma. So we're going to set that global context. And then I'm going to do RGB extraction. This is actually the channel extraction feature right here. And we're just going to keep the defaults RGB and apply that. And what we'll get is six images that represent the red, the green, and the blue. Now these will be useful for a couple reasons. Let's uh, go ahead and stretch them. Now I'm going to show you that the, uh, we'll do, actually I'll just bring up my screen transfer. <clears throat> so this is the blue. This is the green. And notice how the green has a lot more detail than the blue. So that channel's a little bit stronger. And then this is the red. And the red also has really good detail. I'm going to actually keep this because this is useful in doing automatic background extraction to have something high contrast that you can use for this. So what we're going to do first is normalize the channels. The way we do that is we use linear fit and we pick the highest intensity channel. At least that's how I do it which was blue, and then we apply it to the other channel. So we're going to apply it to red, and that's going to do a computation. This is a pretty high resolution image, so it takes a moment. And while well, I keep closing my screen transfer function. I shouldn't do that. <clears throat> so we'll renormalize that and then we'll take our green and we're going to drag this onto the green. Let that compute. And then we're going to combine these back. <clears throat> but while I have the channels separated, I'm going to take advantage of the enhanced contrast that I have on this red one. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and minimize these images. Slide them over here out of the way. That's our original, so we can probably safely close it, but I'll just hang on to it for now. And then we're going to zoom in here. Now the key, in my experience, to a good dynamic background extraction is to have as large a square as you can and really cover the areas that don't have stars. So this is going to be a little challenging because this is such a heavy star field. But we will work with it. So I'm going to open up my dynamic background extraction and with this tool <clears throat> we have a couple of things we can do I'm just going to close this out to get out of the way I'm interested in the sample generation size now 49 is the default that might be a little big with the star field and you can see these black holes over here are stars so I'm going to probably tweak that down maybe to 20. So we'll change this to 20. Resize all. Now you can generate. I personally find that when I generate these I spend more time going through the generated squares and actually I'll make that a little bit bigger than I do actually if I place them myself. So let's resize all. So what I'm going to do is just start 
finding little spots that don't have stars. Now this can be a pretty tedious process because I'm eyeballing here and then I'm double checking my work over on the side and I'm trying to get coverage in all these quadrants. So I'm gonna basically span like this. <clears throat> now something interesting while I'm doing this that you may not know is sometimes when you get images you can have a light pollution like maybe there the moon was in a certain position in the sky or maybe there is light pollution from a city and you might get a fade that comes from a direction this one seems to be pretty centered but if that fades off direction all you have to do is take these crosshairs and drag it so it's in the center of the fade and we're going to move that spot so this is fine where it's at but that's a little tip if you get those off center fades. It's okay to overlap these, so if I find an area that seems to be pretty free, I might do a couple extra. And again, tedious process, but well worth it in the end, as I think you'll see when we actually pull the trigger on this. Now what I'm making sure is that I'm not interfering with the nebulosity, so I'm going to give that some space. And if we look at our reference picture, you can see that there's faint nebulosity all the way around it. So we have to keep that in mind while we're doing this. So let's go ahead and keep working through. So I'm pretty happy with this quadrant. Some people put a lot more, but I think if it has a statistically indicative sample that we're pretty good. So we'll start working on this quadrant. Click, click, click. And if I had done this as a pre-recorded video, I could just fast forward for you. But since we're doing this live, you get to sit with me through the entire tedious process. Good news is this is the only one that take so much manual intervention, but I feel like <clears throat> this is a key. If you do this step right, a lot of the other processing comes into play, because when we looked at the image, it was pretty noisy. So we've got our work cut out for us. I live in a pretty light polluted area, and the setup I use, the Stellina, is a great all-in-one tool, but it only does 10 second exposure. So there's not many options filter wise or whatever to deviate from the just standard CCD images that we get. So getting good coverage here, I want to make sure I get some out on the border. And I'm surprised I'm not seeing that in this image, but sometimes when you click and you place an image, or I'm sorry, you place a sample, the sample will turn red, meaning it's outside of the tolerance limits. If you get that, that's not the end of the world. You want to accurately represent your background. All you need to do is come up here and change this tolerance level. So if one of these images was green, I'm sorry, was red, I would up the tolerance and click resize. and slowly increment it until it happens. And actually, I can probably do the reverse, right? I can take the tolerance way down to 0, 1. And be careful, don't click Generate, because that will clobber all your work. But if you do Resize All, it applies that. And see how these are all red. So what we do is we find the lowest tolerance that we can get away with and still have all of these be gray or green. So we actually just lowered the tolerance from 0.5 to 0.3, but that's okay because all of these are going to be in range. And this is a massive star field, which actually should turn out to be quite nice once we get 
through our processing steps. So I'm continuing to place these and again I could automatically generate these but I find that places so many ones over existing stars that I spend all my time scanning through the auto-generated ones and I might as well just plug these in myself and you can use these icons down here in the lower corner right here this one will actually get you to actual size of the picture so if I do this it's going to zoom in and give me a really good look at what I'm working with. So you can see it's actually easier to place these because I can see the spaces. But I don't like to always zoom in this deep because I lose a little bit of context. So let's just make this quadrant big. Keep clicking through. I feel like if you're still with me now, you are a dedicated astro person because this is probably not the most exciting thing to watch but I found going through this process and I do use automatic background extraction too I find when there's gradients it's really good at just automatically finding those and fixing them and sometimes I'll use the two of these together so after I dynamically extract the background then I'll apply an automatic background extraction. They don't always complement each other, but it doesn't hurt because in PixInsight, you've got the undo feature, so you can always try it out and then undo if it doesn't work out quite as expected. You might see me do that a few times during this live attempt to process this image. I had already processed it off of three nights of sessions, but I'm curious to see if I can get a better image out of this session. So let's go here, and I'm going to just call that a wrap. We've got 162 samples, which is a good size. Now here's the important thing. I'm actually not going to run this on this. I was just using the red as a guide. I'm going to save this icon here so it's got all my settings and I'm going to actually close this out. After all that work, I trust that my settings are here. And we're going to go to RGB Combine. Now remember we did that normalization using the blue channel. So what we're doing now is we're taking those normalized channels and we're combining them. So we get a new image. I like to go ahead and name that image NGC688, four sessions. Um, I think I had 743 frames. This helps me remember what went into the image. So we'll do that. And let's do the big reveal. So we're going to do screen transfer function. And we're not going to link the channels, we're just going to do it as is. And as you can see, it comes out much more natural colors. It's not that washed out blue. So I'm going to do something that some people extremely dislike, which is close out my old images. Some people like to keep them through the whole session. But I like to keep it clear what I'm working with primarily. And so if I know I'm not going to need an image, this is the one saved on disk, so that'll be easy to come back to. I'm good to go. So now I'll take that dynamic background extraction that I saved. And you can see everything's restored. We're going to use subtraction. If we had vignetting, if we had like a really major fade and this has some of it but not so much we would use actually let's look at the difference between the two so let's do subtraction I'm gonna just check it and all of these are going to turn red because they're now normalized and so they're no longer inside of that background tolerance so I need to reset my stretch 
to see the effects. And I'm just going to close this out because, again, I have it saved as an icon. So we can see it did a pretty good job, but notice, I don't know if this is showing up on video, but there's pretty solid glow in the middle. Let me just reverse that. And let's see if divide gives us a different result. So I'm going to do division, let it process, restretch. And I think it's a lot better. Now this is when, if I still see a little bit of banding, I might see if automatic background extractor will work to my favor as well. I'm keeping all the defaults. Just reset it to default. And I need to set subtraction. And I'm just going to replace the target image because I can always undo. So it's processing. And it did a great job of getting rid of that. So we're going to stick with that. So now what I'm going to do is neutralize the background. That sort of evens it out, so to speak. And the way to do that is to find a patch of background and create a preview on it, which this is, I'm zoomed in because the star field is so dense. But I feel like there's a piece I can get right up here. So if we zoom in, come into that spot, um, yeah. So this right here, so I'm going to use this to create a new preview. I'm going to make the box as big as I can without bumping into too many stars. Now this is just a little slice, but it's enough to get a, a sample in place. So with that preview there, I'm going to go to background neutralization. I'm going to use that preview as the reference image. And I'm just going to drop that in. And sometimes you don't really notice a difference, which is fine. So now this is a step I don't see a lot of people do. I like to do it, which is in the scripts. There's something called image analysis. An image solver will figure out the coordinates of what you're looking at and embed it in the file so that information is built into the file. So what I need to do is I need to give it the focal distance of my telescope, which is 400 millimeters. The pixel size is 2.4, but I use something called drizzle to amplify it actually three times because I like to work with a really high resolution image and then shrink it down to get rid of noise. So I divide the pixel size by three, which is 0 0.8. I approximate the date that I took the, the image. So we'll just say this. And now we give it a baseline set of coordinates to start from so that it's not skimming the entire universe to figure out where we're at. So this is the Crescent Nebula. We'll click OK. And you're going to see my process window, which I had off screen just to keep it out of the way. It's spinning through doing a lot of checks and tests. It's basically using some mathematical algorithms to figure out exactly what the bounds of my image are. So it's solved the image. It's figured that out. So now we can use my favorite method of color calibration, which is photometric calibration. For this to work, what it does is it matches your image up to known images and then uses those to figure out what the color should be. So 
you have similar inputs to the image solver, but because we already solved this, I can just do acquire from image. Click OK. And now it's got all of the coordinates. So now we're going to just cross our fingers because this is one of those processes that doesn't always work based on how clear the image is and distortion models and a bunch of other factors. And I'll go ahead and show the process if it lets me drag this over. So right now it's looking at reference images. It's doing some transformations to compare them apples to apples to my image. And then it's figuring out the delta that needs to be applied to make the colors true to what some of these accepted images have. So we're going to let it run through. And again, it's taking a little bit longer than normal because of the resolution size of the image. It has to work with a lot of data. You can see there's a lot of stars it's finding. But we should be there pretty soon. I feel like it's converging on a solution. And there we go. So it's found a solution and it's applied it. Over here, we have a graph that I can pretend like I know how to look at and interpret. Someone knows how to do that. I just close it. I'm done with photometric calibration. And this is the result. Now, if we stretch it, it's going to stretch ugly. Well, not too bad, but we're getting closer to something workable now. So now that I've done this, this is what we call a linear state. And if I look at this tab, notice this green line. This is telling me it's linear. It hasn't been stretched. The pixel data is very faint. If you look at the R, the G, the B at the bottom, as I scroll over, notice they're like 0 0.00. And what our eyes perceive is going to be in a much higher range. That's why we stretch it. But before we stretch it, there's a few things we can do. The two things I'm interested in are reducing some of the noise and what we call deconvolution. I'll get to deconvolution in a second. But to reduce the noise, I don't want to do it indiscriminately. I'm really more concerned with the background than anything else. Let's preview a sample that takes nebulosity, big stars, and little stars. It's a pretty big preview. And we can see we've got this color noise and distortion and other things going on. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make a mask. And I'm going to do that by clicking this icon up here, Extract CIE L Component. So you could go into Process, All Processes. And there's channel extraction, there is LRGB combination. So there are a few options that let you work with this. I'm just going to straight, boom, pull the luminance. Now this is also linear, because that's what I copied it from. Masks, however, are based on the intensity from 0 to 1 of the position in the mask. So something higher offers more protection. Something lower offers no protection. So we want this to be stretched in order to be effective. So the way we stretch it, first I'm going to go ahead and give it a name. And I'm going to save this linear version for something later. So I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm going to stretch what I duplicated. So I'm going to call this loom mask. And we'll probably fix that spelling. Then I'm going to open my screen transfer function, stretch it. Then I'm going to open up my histogram transformation. So this is 
an interesting tool. I use it quite a bit. Right now, it's this flat line. Nothing interesting is happening. The first thing I'm going to do is with this image highlighted, I'm going to click this checkbox. And that's going to track it to the view. And what you can see is that this part right here is now on the loom mask. So now it's tracking, and we get this kind of curve here that's showing what the image looks like, and then we can see where it's going to be when it's stretched. So the screen transfer function has already stretched this for me. So what I want to do is I want to preview what the stretch is going to look like. And I'm going to go ahead and drag the screen transfer function onto the bar for the histogram. So it applies the stretch. Now this just became washed out because this is a preview of the stretch that is also stretched. So it's a double stretch. So I'm just going to turn that off and that's what I'm working with. Now this is just a preview and I actually want to tweak a few things before I commit. I've got a lot of background in here and it'd be nice to tweak this so that the background has less protection because that's what's noisy. So I'm using my mouse wheel to scroll in. You can also edit these here. And looking at these two controls, this control is shadows, this control is highlights. Now I can move shadows to the right, and you'll see the corresponding image gets darkened. I can go pretty extreme. And you also notice these numbers start appearing here. These are showing what's called uh, clipped pixels. It's pixels that are getting cut out because of the nature of how we're transforming them. We don't want any clipped pixels. That's losing information. So I'm going to drag this over to minimize these. Now it's not as important because this is a duplicate of, it's not our source image, but it's still good to preserve what we can. And I'm going to darken by moving this out. I'm just finding a place where I feel like it is offering protection to the nebula here. And the stars are fine, but the background is starting to fade out. So we're going to apply that. And this will get washed out because it's a preview of a preview. But now we have our mask. So what we can do with this mask is we can come here and do select mask. Pick our luminance mask, and you'll notice everything turns red. This is to show me what the mask is going to be doing. Red protects anything else is not protected. So right now, the stars and part of the nebula are subject to whatever I do, but the background is not. And to see what that looks like, I'm going to hit Control K take this off and I'm going to do some pixel math. Pixel math is a whole topic of itself but let's just do a simple equation that says I want you to turn every pixel to zero which is black. Now this will honor the mask so if we drop it we can see that it didn't actually turn everything to zero. The mask protected to a certain extent. So let me undo that. So we've seen how that works. Now let's go ahead and Control shift i invert it. So now we're where I want to be, which is with the nebula and stars protected, the background not so much. We'll pull up our preview and then I'm going to use a multi-scale linear transform. And I actually have my preferred settings saved here. And what this is doing is it's separating the image into multiple layers and I'm applying these noise reductions to the different layers. And think of layers as looking at the picture at different scales. The lowest layer is going to be the pixel level. Highest layer is going to be like structures like stars and whatnot. So with this, we can go ahead and click the preview button. 
And one thing I love about previews is if you look at this little button right here, that will actually toggle between the original image and the preview. So original image preview. Now this probably doesn't show up well on video, but it's definitely smoothing it out, so I like it. But it's subtle enough that it's not going to make the image look artificial, in my opinion. So I'm going to run that. And looking at the overall picture, we probably won't see as much of a difference. But having this noise reduced before we stretch is going to help tremendously with some of our other processing steps. So this is run. Now I'm going to deal with another issue, which is the chrominance and the color noise. So we're going to go ahead and switch to chrominance mode, run our preview. And the preview is the opportunity to make fast tweaks because it doesn't have to do the full round of computations that it would on the, the full image. So now we've got this image, and I'm going to revert to the previous. And I can see a night and day difference. Again, not sure if this is showing up on video, but I'll zoom in. So that is before the chrominance. This is after. Very happy with that result. So click on my main image, and I'll run that. Now, I'm not going to have time to process the entire image tonight, but I'm going to go ahead and go through my next step because I love the fact that it uses masks. So it's going to show a lot of different aspects of PixInsight, and that's deconvolution. So for deconvolution, we need a few things. The first thing we need is a star mask. We only want to run it against our stars. You might be tempted to go here and run a star mask. That's this little option. But there's actually a way I'm convinced is a much better way. And I'm going to come back to my luminance mask. This is a quick way to jump between things. And I'm going to duplicate it and call this Nebula. Then I'm going to reach into my bag of tools and pull up StarNet, which uses a neural network to apply artificial intelligence and literally remove the stars. And it'll relocate them to a mask if you check this box. So we're going to bring this in so we can see our progress. And I'm just going to drop this right down here. So you can see it's starting to process. And this does have a graphics card, and my version supports the graphics card. So hopefully after the initial delay, we're going to see a pretty rapid processing. And there it goes. So not too bad for speed. Let's let that run. And poof, it's like magic. This is our star mask. These are the stars. And this is what was left behind. Now you can see it didn't get the really bright stars, which is fine. We might want to process them with the nebula, or we might want to get rid of them. But we've got choices. This star mask I'm not going to use as is, simply because I want the stars to be adequately covered. And so to do that, I'm going to use the morphological transformation tool. Now I have something here called grow. This is dilation, so it's going to take stars and make them bigger. And I'm going to go ahead and do three iterations. So if you watch it, notice that everything got bigger. 
but I also don't want to have rough edges. So if we look at this, the mask is pretty solid on the edges. And we want it to blend smoothly. So I'm going to go to this blur, which is convolution. And I'm going to apply the blur. So now I've got my stars masked. And we can see this if I go to the mask, select star mask. There's protecting the stars. There's exposing the stars and protecting the background, which is what we're going to do. Now, for deconvolution to work, it needs what's called a point spread function. This is something that is computed based on the factors of individual stars. So in other words, stars can get distorted. We can see these are not perfect circles, most of them. But there's usually a uniformity to that distortion that a point spread function can pick up and then apply to tightening up the stars. So to get to that stage, we're going to need to do a couple of steps. The first thing is to generate the PSF. But to do that, I'm going to create yet another mask. This mask is called Binarize, and I'll show you why. So here's our luminance. I'm going to duplicate it. I'm going to call this saturation. What I want to do is identify the brightest or more saturated stars and not use them for my point spread function. I want to use less saturated stars. So what we can do is pull out our binarize. I'm just looking for it. So what binarize does is pretty straightforward. It looks at every pixel in your image, there's a cutoff, and if it's beneath or above the cutoff, it's going to flip it to either white or black. So it's going to be a binary set of colors for that. So I've got this set at 0.8, so it needs to have a pretty good brightness for this to take effect. So let's go ahead and apply it, and we get what looks like a star mask. We're going to use this on this image, not to protect the stars, but to identify stars that we don't want. And I'll show you how that works. So I'll do saturation, vert mask, and then control K. You can see a bunch of these stars are actually highlighted. And I'm going to go to my luminance mask to do the point spread function. So let's again select mask, saturation, and again this is just flagging stars that don't make sense for my point spread function. So let's go ahead and open that. Dynamic PSF. And what this is going to let me do is start selecting stars on my image. So let's do that. I'm just going to hover over. I'm looking for ones that are not red. So unsaturated stars. And I want to get the target goal is about 40 of these, which I don't think is going to be a problem. And some of these stars just don't have enough data for the point spread function to work. So I'm going to keep keep on searching. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Actually, and if you ever make a mistake like that, you want to get rid of it, you can just delete that. 
it's that red minus. So we'll pick this star, not enough data. There we go. Come down here. We actually have a lot of stars. Go here. Wow, this is slow going. I usually have 40 by now, but I'm getting so many that aren't registering. Searching, searching, searching. Okay, keep going. And zoom in a little bit more. So this will give us some good options. Star, 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 star. And it's really not wanting to pick up a bunch of these. Now see how these stars are stretched this way? That is not how a star is supposed to look. So part of what deconvolution, deconvolution should do is help correct that. Okay, we've got some good stars here. And we'll come over here. Looks like we might have some decent stars. This is the more time consuming. The fun part comes after we stretch it. Okay, I'm just going to go with these. Once you have the stars you want, I control A on the grid to select everything and use this little camera. And this is what it's computed as a function to correct these stars. Now that we've done that, I no longer need my saturation mask. So I'm going to go ahead and take that and get rid of it. I want to make sure my star mask is on. And we're actually working with the main image now. So let's do mask, select mask star mask and there the stars are covered here the stars are wide open so we're going to go back to this preview and work on this to get the stars where we want so I'm going to open up deconvolution I'm going to go to external PS tab Pick that PSF or point spread function we just generated. I'm probably going to do 50 iterations to start with, and I don't touch anything else yet. I will if I need to. Right now, I'm just interested in how this impacts the stars. So let's drag this on. This is our preview, so we're good. Previews automatically reset. And it's tightened them. And I'm going to go ahead and jump back, forward, back, forward. So it's a good effect, but we've got these nasty artifacts, these like rings. So we'll go to the next section here, which is D ringing. And I usually tweak this to a pretty low value like 0 0.001, run it, and it'll reset the preview before it runs it. It does that automatically. So 
26, 27, 28, 29. There we go. And we still have the rings. They're not as prominent, but I'm going to amp this up to 0 0.009. Run that. And again, in the other window that you can't see, we've got the iterations going through. Okay, this is good because I have another trick up my sleeve. I like the way these have tightened up. And the banding, I think I can deal with a different way. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it here and go ahead and apply it to the image as a whole. And where we really have to be careful is some of the bigger stars. See what happens to them. We may have to undo and retweak it if we get major artifacts. So my understanding, and I haven't verified this, is that the deconvolution was used on the Hubble Space Telescope when a flaw was found in the lens. That's how the algorithm got developed. And what people realized was that the atmosphere can be looked at as a kind of giant lens. And we can correct for flaws and distortions in the atmosphere using this algorithm. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but it makes sense to me. Now, if I still had severe ringing, and I, the problem with the global dark or the D-ringing is when you get to a certain level, it'll actually cause this ripple effect and things will start to look worse off. You can also use this local D-ringing and that is going to be a topic I'm going to cover in another episode where I focus exclusively on masks. And in that, I'll show you how to make a mask for what's called local D-ringing support. It's actually a way to get rid of some of those bands. But we'll see if my other trick works. And I think right now I'm suffering from the competition between streaming and doing heavy compute at the same time. So this process is both running slow and my stream is running slow. So hopefully we'll get through this soon. over halfway there and then if this goes well we can get to the fun part which is the stretching and post-processing of the image and that'll involve a lot more masks as well you can see why we experiment on just a small slice or use the preview feature to experiment with this because it is time and computationally intensive and we want to make sure we're close to where we need to be before we actually release it onto the entire image. And this is also, again, I created a high resolution image purposefully so I can manipulate it at the high resolution and then shrink it back and get rid of some of the noise. But that's also causing some of the processing to take a lot longer. All right, we're almost there, and once I get to the stretch, I'm going to stop this video and continue with the post-processing in a second video. Hopefully this has been educational to see what the process looks like. Hopefully we'll see a good result from this deconvolution, and then we're going to do some noise reduction. Okay, so move this out. Now we've got 
some of these stars with these bands on it. There's actually a script called Correct Magenta Stars. I'm going to use the star mask. I'll actually remove it from the main image, and you can't do things while the script's open. So let's remove the mask. Let's go back in. Correct magenta stars. We use our star mask. And we're going to execute. And if we zoom into an area, see how this is kind of orange tinted? If I undo what happened, Actually, I have to undo multiple times because we're now walking through all the steps of the script. And we're in an awkward state here. Let's take this off and restretch it. Okay, I'm going to redo my noise reduction, redo the deconvolution. Okay, so you can see that high contrast. Redo the magenta halo. Remover. Oh, and this is again, I got caught up in the intermediary step. Stretch that. And much smoother image. So I'm happy with that. Let me conclude. So we've reduced some noise, we've deconvolved to get our stars a little bit sharper. I'm done with linear processing. The rest of this will be done on the stretched image. So let's get to that stretched image. I like to use a script, part of the easy processing suite. I can post details for that. It doesn't ship, I don't believe, with PixInsight. It's an add-on. And they have this script called Soft Stretch. And this will let you preview the image and figure out what level you want to stretch at. For example, if I target a higher median, I don't know if you can see that, but we have kind of a washed out background. But if we pull that in, that background now gets nice and dark. Now, I'm not looking for it to be completely black. If there's still some artifacts, I can deal with those in the stretched image. But this looks like it's a good level, so we'll run that soft stretch. And the image is already starting to look a lot nicer. Still got a ways to go, but we are well on the road, and it looks like we're going to have some really incredible nebula detail coming out. So I'm going to stop this here. Thank you for bearing with me as we went through these initial steps. And I will join you back on another video where we process this stretched image.